Welcome, everybody, to Crossing the Line with Greg Heim, where we talk about all things that affect the economy, and particularly housing. Today, we have a special guest. Very lucky to have James Nelson here, principal and head of Avis & Young's Tri-State Investment Sales Group, which is a mouthful. But more importantly, he's the man who literally wrote the book on real estate investing, right? You do have a Thank book yes. about real estate. So he wrote the book, so whatever he says goes. How are you doing on this not-so-bad morning? Fantastic. Wonderful to be here. Well, we'll see. Hopefully, you'll, you'll feel that way at the end of it. Now, we, we tend to have a pretty good time here. Uh, it's our 26th, 22nd episode. You know, we're doing the whole numbers song thing, and then I realized the only song I come up with was Taylor Swift's song, 22. And I don't feel 22, like like the song says. in the. So we may have to stop doing that stuff. But it's April 22nd today, so that that's 22. We have okay. 22 in the date. I guess that's close enough. But... Why don't you give the uh, our uh, listeners and watchers a little bit of background? Because it's always interesting how people get into. I'm in real estate by a complete series of accidents that are mm -hmm. unrelated, that have to do with baseball simulation games and stuff like that, and government shutdowns. Yeah. But how did you get into investment sales? So it was complete luck. I've been doing this now for 25 years. I was. Uh a senior at Colgate University, an English major, had no idea what I wanted to do. All my friends had investment banking jobs, so I went up to the Career Service Center and saw a posting to become a sales associate for Massey Knackle and yeah. uh, applied for the job, and miraculously, they called me. Uh, later, I found out that only two people applied for the job, and I was their <laughs> second choice. So um, started with very low standards. I mean, today, it's so much more competitive to get into the business, but we had an incredible run. Right. I was a partner there, uh, 17 years. We sold it to Cushman and Wakefield, another three years there. Uh, and then Avis and Young called and wanted my help to build out an investment sales platform. So I've been there now for a little over six years, and it is a mouthful. But yes, we, we handle the tri-state investment sales uh, for all different asset classes. So we sell apartment buildings, retail, office development. I'm starting to do a lot more work uh, across the country as well now. Well, that's good. Uh, yeah, it seems like you've been incredibly successful. Again, writing the book on investment sales that's and investing, that's great. Um, as you know, we typically start with our blog items, and we have two, and this one is certainly relevant to, to your business. Uh, retail sales surged in March. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have been looking for just a three-tenth of a percent gain. It was more than double that at 0.7%. At Again, that's a monthly increase, which makes it so impressive. You know, the, the, the prior month, February, was also revised up to almost 1%, so getting that high up from a revised up number is, is, you know, the double good news as we like to call it. Uh, I guess for, for me as an economist, it, it, it's amazing that the consumer is still spending because you look at the 1.1 trillion in credit card debt that's been run up, the, the weight of this inflation that's been crushing us for two years. It's been very, as the economists call it, sticky, uh, housing being the main culprit for most people. Uh, and, and, you know, one thing we, we always caution that these are not adjusted for inflation. So you could be getting less stuff, even if you're spending more, which we certainly know a lot about. Uh, just to give you the other highlights of the report, year over year sales up 4%. During that time, prices were up 3.5%. So that's like a half a percent increase in the actual number of items. But that's okay because for so many months, people were paying more for less stuff. So this is good. And for the curious, like how much stuff sells in a month, uh, they retail sales in March came in as is in a at a seasonally adjusted seven hundred and nine billion dollars. Ah, it's just a curiosity thing. Uh, this beautiful set here at Studio eighteen seventy three is brought to you by the Everset. The Everset provides full service staging and furniture rental solutions in the New York area. For more information, please visit us at staging.theeverset.com or email us at staging at theeverset.com to request a free proposal. The biggest increase in sales was non-store retailers, people you probably don't like, AKA internet sales. Although they do lease buildings, right? They do, we know Google tends to buy a lot of buildings, particularly here in New York. And gas stations, you know, gas prices have risen sharply the last two months, so that's, that's not surprising. And we always like to point out that consumer spending is 70% of GDP. So we really need the consumers to be out there uh, buying stuff. And uh, we're gonna get 
two big reports this week. We have the GDP report coming out on Thursday for the first quarter. And on Friday, we have one of our favorites here, the PCE report. That's right. Uh, the, it's funny because that, that, you know, we, we always talk about the consumer price index and retail sales that they're like great reports and moves markets, but the PCE literally is the more complete version of both of those because it gives us the definitive data and it's the one the fed watches the core PCE on pricing, but it also tells you the total volume of sales. Mm. And the difference is they count up all of the sales. Re retail sales is, is done via survey as is consumer price index data. Um, one of the things that's interesting between the two is that for consumer price index, they weight the data by asking people, like how much do you spend on this? And one of the th examples that we found was alcohol, right? That when they asked people, uh, they, they weighted it way too low. Maybe they were embarrassed to say, hey, I spent like 20% of my money on alcohol. Um, so anyhow, it, it, what we're looking for, well, what the Atlanta Fed's GDP now is looking for is just under 3% rate of growth in the first quarter, which is unbelievable. You know, you, you can't count this mark, the, the consumer out anymore because they just keep spending. And people say, oh, this has got to be good news. Well, like the better than expected employment reports, it's good news for, for the people out there, but it's not good news for the Fed trying to get this inflation down lower. They're I keep using the reference, James, that they're in the red zone. You know, they're, they're inside the 20. It's hard to get the ball in. The Jets can never mm -hmm. do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, getting it down from nine to, to, you know, under four was easy. Now that now they're having a hard time getting it closer to the two um, percent. All right. So let's let's talk about the retail market here in New York City and other areas you deal with, a lot of people have this misconception that retail is dying. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not what the latest data shows. And you, you, you were, we were talking before we went on air about an interesting trend with luxury retailers and, and how they're active in the market. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Sure. And, and not surprised to hear that luxury retail is doing so well. It, it you see what type of real estate they're acquiring, and, and it's really been a huge driver for investment sales here in New York. So uh, in the fourth quarter last year, Prada comes in and acquires uh, $800 million worth of real estate on Fifth Avenue to really establish their presence. And then not to be outdone, Gucci comes in and pays over $900 million, uh, their parent company, Caring. So really a sign that, uh, not only are global retailers doing well, but they believe in New York City long term and they're really willing to step up in today's market, which we could say is a little uncertain and uh, make that long term investment. So that, that's been a really positive thing uh, to see. I did want to go back to, to one little point you made about the uh, digitally native brands. And what we've seen is that uh, you, you might think that that's a bad thing to, for bricks and mortar uh, from the onset, but we found is once those brands expand and no better one than Warby Parker, and, and you see that they, they start that way and then they need physical locations. Why? Because customer acquisition costs are so expensive now online that they're actually finding that it's, it's cheaper in many cases to acquire that customer uh, in the store. And furthermore, this whole issue with returns, uh, once you start sending boxes back and forth, it really eats into the profits. So I might be talking my own book, a different book than the no, no, no. investing, but I, I appreciate you mentioning We were on a pa uh, panel years ago mm -hmm. and uh, I upset a leading retail broker by saying the only reason to have brick and mortar stores was for returns. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it's proven not to be true. So it is, I guess, a great move by these luxury brands. Let's fix our costs and, and own our real estate. Uh, and it's it doubles as an investment, right? Because conceivably, you, you, it'll go up over time. And that's what what other on the retail side is. Can you identify any other groups that are buying uh, these retail spaces? Well, the, yeah, so end users and, and the, the research that we did was uh, over two thirds of the vacant retail was purchased by end users. So, yes, you've got the, the Pradas and the right. Gucci's that, that are you know, globally recognized brands, but you also have a lot of mom and pops. Uh, whether it's restaurants, uh, we, we sold uh, a retail space on, on Park Avenue to uh, a, a Japanese tea 
company. So, and again, this wasn't a, a massive store. It was a, a small mixed use building, uh-huh. but we're seeing a lot of that investment and it makes sense. And for some owner users, isn't, is, it isn't just retail also for uh, small businesses who want to own their office space. There's actually pretty attractive financing uh, available for that in the form of small business loans. So okay. that, that's a trend that we see because Meanwhile, a lot of investors might not want to take the the risk uh, to buy vacant retail and to lease that up. I mean, maybe they would be willing to, but trying to finance that would be a, a whole nother story. Interesting. I had, and again, you know, we, we see data about the retail market coming back and, and in some ways even maybe looking better than pre-COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, there was this article about storefronts being, the vacancy being high was 11%, you know, versus six before. And that's a citywide number. So... You know, headlines are easy to grab if you say bad data goes up, you know, good data gets worse. Uh, all right, the other thing we had in the uh, in the blog this week was existing home sales. After two great months to start the year, existing home sales fell sharply in March. And it's really only due to mortgage rates because inventory actually went up um, at a decent clip. And this, if you think about it, at the end of last year, the end of November through the end of 23, mortgage rates went down over a full percent. So it wasn't a surprise. You'd see the January and February data come in strong. You know, here in New York, it takes a long time to close sales, particularly co-ops. But the rest of the country, it's it's much quicker. Um, but what's happened this year is rates are, are just keep edging back up again and just hit uh, 7% for the first time since November. So that that is concerning. Um, again, inventory was up almost 5% to a little over a million homes. But even with, you know, more inventory and high rates, prices still went up year over year. It's, it shows you the shortage of, of housing product that we have. It's the, the double whammy that's really hurting affordability. And to your potential home buyers out there, I don't know that I'm the best person, Ray, to give, a, a you know, you a Newt Rockney speech. But, you know, keep your chin up. You know, they're moving in the wrong direction. That That is true, mortgage rates. But they're still almost a percent lower than the average over the last half century. I think we lose track of where rates are in normal times because when I started writing this blog, the first edition was J- July 2020 when mortgage rates crossed 3% for the first time. Mm-hmm. So when something's happened that's never happened before, you can't expect it to happen again so quickly. Uh, but, you know, Everybody's waiting for the Fed to cut rates, but they forget, and we we probably do this every episode, just remind people that the Fed is, is cutting short-term rates. There's no direct correlation to mortgage rates. Um, conceivably, if the Fed's cutting rates, it's because the economy needs a little juice, which should bring long-term rates down. But all you need to know about how the Fed affects the mortgage market, the Fed hasn't touched rates since July. And we put a chart in the blog showing what mortgage rates have done since July. They go up and down almost every day. So, you know, and conditions change. So, and you can always refinance. If you need a home, want a home, find a home you love. And I bought my home one of the worst possible times, 2006. And I had a 6.5% mortgage rate. And I was very happy. And I'm still in the house. The rate's gone down, but I'm still still very happy. Um, And... Also remember your your savings rates have gone up too. You know, it, when mortgages are three percent, you're getting a quarter of a percent on your money market. Now you're getting four or five percent, um, which is actually interesting because there's a, a small group of economists that are daring to go out there and say that raising rates actually is the reason why the economy is doing better than expected, because it's raised people's savings and and you're buying treasuries you're getting a higher rate of return enabling people to spend more money this you know jury's not out on that yet but we'll see do you have any thoughts on that I, wow I, I was just saying thank god for economists that, that that's well we talk grade. out of both <laughs> sides of, of our mouth you know i mean it does make sense people getting a higher return on their think about it you know the bond rates have gone up right, right. money market rates have gone up the stock market has gone right. up. That's true. Everything has gone up. So, yeah. you know. But it, it does make sense from, and again, coming from the, the commercial broker, talking about the residential market, uh, beware. But it, it does make sense that a lot of homeowners are sitting on cheap mortgages. We'll see what happens once those start to roll. Th- those who maybe didn't lock in 30-year, they locked in five, seven-year mortgages, so they don't want to sell off while they're benefiting from that low interest. Right. So we'll see. But 
it, it was interesting to hear the point that supply nationally has gone up because, as we know, that's not what's happening here in New York. And I, I know we're going to get to the, the rental stock and right. what just happened up in Albany. But just, you know, specifically talking about uh, new development, new condo inventory, and, and you would know your data better. But we see it from the land sales side. There, there's been so little land that has sold over the last couple of years here, not just for rental, but for, for condo development, right. uh, that it, it seems like the supply has been cut in half. So th that that's certainly going to keep pricing. Well, and, and look, and rates go up for buyers. They go up for builders, too. You know, they, they have to pay more in interest and the right. cost of everything is so much more expensive. In, and that that therein lies the challenge. You know, we feel fortunate here in, in New York City that we've had at least a decent level of inventory to sell because it kept prices from getting out of whack. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's really rough on the on the home buyer out there when mortgage rates double in a, in a year and prices keep going up. It's 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 tough, but it's not always going to stay that way. All right, we're going to keep going uh, with James right after this message. <laughs> What do you really need to know about buying or selling a home? First, it's serious business. And it's complicated. There's a lot of money on the table, and emotion too. You need an agent who knows the ropes. So, whether you're buying or selling your home, work with professionals who have a mastery of the craft. And we're back with James Nelson. I forgot to, you know, I, I forgot to mention I, I had a, just had the best weekend ever. So I'm, I'm a little tired this morning, but I'm trying to. Mm -hmm. uh, I went a concert on Friday, the great Mike Del Judas. Nick game on Saturday, big win against the Sixers and the Rangers yesterday. So I'm, I'm, you know, really good. It's rare. We're, we're not I'm in a really that in New York. You know, Hopefully it's, it'll carry over to football season. Now, unfortunately, I'm a Jets fan, so I. I don't have a lot of faith in that, but you know, until Rogers gets hurt again, I guess we got to go with it. It's 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 what do I say? You go to battle with the team that you have, and I think we're going to have Zach Wilson for another year because nobody seems to want him. Uh, all right, so let's move to the the office market because this is something that is on people's minds a lot because the return to office numbers have kind of flattened out. I think most people thought we'd be at 80 percent now, and the numbers aren't. You know the the best you know there's a big discrepancy between revenues numbers and castles but they seem to move in the right direction but the availability rate your latest report had it a little over 19 percent mm -hmm. um does that scare you uh well it doesn't surprise me for right. sure but i mean first of all to, to go and take a step back so definitely subscribe to the revenue report over castle castle is obviously just in the buildings that they they service they do Re by the key card right, right? revenue is really kind of giving a, a larger swath of of office that's out there and i would be curious i'd love to see the comparison on a, a monday to thursday or tuesday to thursday because i think once you sprinkle in friday you know that, that that's gonna. Well, Tuesday is the new Monday, right. and Thursday is the new Friday. Not People, in my office. But. Well, no, I'm sure not, <laughs> and, and not here at Brown Harris Stevens, yes. of course. We work 24 seven, but I, I, you know, everybody wants a four day work week, but it, it, you know. It's funny. There's been studies done overseas about this, and they've actually found that people have been more productive with a four day work week. Mm. I mean, you get the stuff earlier because everybody's rushing to get the stuff done on Thursday anyway. Uh, but I mean, does this, every time there's a, whether it's the financial crisis or the tech mm -hmm. bubble bursting, you hear that, and you know, in seventies and eighties, a lot of large companies left New York city, but to show you the resiliency, right? The deal with Amazon fell apart. Amazon keeps leasing space here. Yeah. They just opened up at the old Lord and Taylor. That's over 3000 people who showed up. So I, I'm glad they don't have hard feelings I'm sure they're about on Friday, one. but uh, so, well, they're, they're, they're here. But um, no, look, I mean, as far as the uh, leasing activity, so 75% of the leasing activity has been focused on the trophy and class A space. So it's, it's definitely a flight to quality. And yeah, I mean, 19% availability translates to about 100 million square feet available, which is which is kind of a scary number. And the reality is, look, a lot of this is obsolete, and we're going to have to try to figure out different uses. I mean, there's obviously been a ton of talk about, you know, what happens to office to resi conversions. We, we've tracked about seven or eight of them. Pretty much all of them have happened down in the financial district. Why? Because it's really a question about basis. I mean, you can have 
you know, a not so great floor plate, but if you buy the building at under $200 a square foot, you can core out light wells and do whatever you need to, to make it work. There's also a zoning question, so we could probably now get a little bit into what has taken place up in Albany. And they do, um, they're going to remove the, the uh, FAR cap, cap right? of 12. No. And, 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 and for, that, for you mm-hmm. listeners and viewers out there, that stands for floor area ratio, right. right? Which basically says how many times the footprint can you go up, right? right. In terms of space. Um, which was capped at 15, I believe. No, they're, they're going to have 15 to 18 times, uh, right. I believe is what the city's going to propose. Now, it will require uh, about a quarter of it to be affordable at an 80%. Right. And look, I mean, everything we'll, we're going to talk about, 421A also, and everything has an affordability component, but as Steve Spinola used to always say, you know, the city has every right to to make these, you know, part of the conditions, whether we like it, you know, that you mentioned the financial district mm-hmm. conversions, you know, 421 G when it was passed, the lower Manhattan plan led to the, you know, a huge boom downtown, yeah. you know, financial district wasn't right. a neighborhood. Right. Now it's FIDI. You right. Know, and- well, that's the big question. I mean, clearly if they're going to give uh, more flexibility in zoning, uh, to your point, there's going to be a trade off with more affordability. I think the reason why the previous 421 a was not as popular is, there were multiple options, but most developers chose the option C, which was, yes, 30% affordable, but that was at 130% of AMI. So, you know, many would say that that's not deeply affordable housing. And so clearly what happened with 45X is you're going to see greater levels of affordability. And so now the question is, is that level of subsidy going to be great enough to actually incentivize developers to build? I mean, if you just listen to what um, Jim Whalen had to say to the press, he thought it was a missed opportunity for housing. He thinks that the requirements for affordability um, offset by also the increased labor cost is going to make it very challenging. Because the big question is, developers are going to, they're reviewing the, the, the new um, rules and subsidies right now, and they're going to make a decision. Does it make sense to get back into the market? And then, you know, where does that translate to land value? Because if you have to end up buying the land for a very cheap price uh, to to be able to provide that level of affordability, which is uh, for these 150 unit plus projects, they're gonna wanna see a quarter of that housing at 60% of AMI. So what does that do to land values in Manhattan, downtown Brooklyn, downtown Queens, where they're gonna ask for this increased wages and is it going to be um, at a level where it just doesn't make sense and then right. nothing gets built? So that, that'll be the big question. We'll, we'll find out within the next year well, that, whether or not this is successful or not. That's what we've been hearing about development for the last decade. You know, why is it all luxury, super luxury buildings? Because that's what makes sense, to, especially in Manhattan, to build yeah. where, where everything is just so more expensive. And the buyers, you know, you talk about the flight to luxury on the office side. You see the same thing on residential. We, we've mm-hmm. seen some unbelievable sales. Yeah. But I do think that the answer is more for housing across the board. More of all. So uh, if you believe the the city's numbers are revenue, we we need somewhere between 500 and 530,000 housing units by 2030 just to keep up with population growth. And so last year there was all of 10,000 I units, Rebney does a good job of, of, of keeping track of that. <laughs> and people forget 421A was yeah. not an affordable housing plan when it was, I, th- I think it started in the early 70s. It was just, we need housing desperately. Right. If you want to build it, this is available. And, you know, it's, again, this, I guess the state has a right to require not just affordability, but also, you know, certain labor and wage standards, uh, they sure. say. And it, it is part of the negotiation and, you know, real estate, doesn't get the uh, the love from Albany as much as it used to, to put it politely, I suppose. They, they, they just look at some of the legislation over the last couple of years, particularly as it pertains to rent stabilization. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have a couple other things in this housing plan. Um, let's start with the, what I think is the worst one is it could cause eviction right. thing. Now, it basically, uh, we had Bess on a couple weeks ago. She called it what I call it, universal rent control. Right. Um, but, you know, basically it, it would give the city the right to set uh, a certain level where if you wanted to increase below that, then, I mean, above that, you'd be in trouble, which is basically annual change in CPI plus 5% or 10%, whichever is lower. But forgetting the, the minutia of the whole thing, it's, I think it's another example, too, whether you call a bill something that's not, Right good cause eviction, it's really rent control. Right. How do you think 
Well, what do you think about this, and how do you think it's going to affect your multifamily market? Well, not your everybody's I mean, <laughs> Any time there's regulation, it's it's not a positive thing for the, the right. fair market. And after 2019, where rent stabilization was basically just frozen in time, right? Mm -hmm. What we saw was that a lot of investors left New York, and they said, "Look, I'd rather go invest in the Southeast, where you know there, there's no caps on what we can do." And we've also seen. Uh, somewhere between 20 to 40,000 units just sit vacant, which is yeah, the crazy warehousing, yeah. because the amount it costs to renovate these units, it doesn't pay if all you could get is an $84 a month increase. They only let you recoup $15,000 right. of what you spent, which could be the cost just to do the lead abatement that's required. So now they've actually doubled that to 30,000. Is that gonna make more of a difference? Probably not, unfortunately. Again, we'll find out in a year or two whether or not these plans and what they did worked because we'll see if, if um, investors, landlords will, will uh, begin to invest in the building stock again. But I, I would say, you know, with 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 the good cause, uh, it's very I guess they modeled it off of what what happened in California. And so many would say, well, you know, 10 percent or CPI plus 5 percent. So call yeah. it what, eight and a half percent is not the end of the world yet. Um, a little concerning once they're under the hood you know what's to say they don't start tweaking that in the future but i was at uh uli uh week before last with a lot of institutional investors and i think for them it was mostly the uncertainty that this good cause thing was out on the horizon we didn't know what it was going to look like and now we at least see what it is and it's not it's not the end of the world right now and obviously if a tenant vacates then you're free to go back and charge whatever you like for the unit um, and there are some exceptions. So any buildings that were built past 2009 are exempted. And there's also um, a, a certainly luxury threshold. I don't know them off the top of my head. It's right. so fresh, it's but very, somewhere around it's very like, high. <laughs> like four and a half thousand for a studio, five and a half, yeah. six thousand. I, I guess uh, Albany didn't think we need to protect those tenants. Probably not. Although, well, rent stabilization, you kind of get a lot of those same tenants that are getting rent stabilized units. But Oh, and then there was some change to rent. You mentioned the, the rent stabilization change of the $30,000 thing. And there are carve outs to all this stuff. And I haven't looked at the bills yet. You know, the thing when you shove everything to a budget bill is it's this, you know, it's like right. a foot high to look at. And one of my things I used to do at Rebney was to track state legislation. So on a day like today, I'd yeah. have been going nuts, faxing it out right. to people. Right. And, well, you know, well, the chat GPT can now do it for us, right? We'll just I, rip it through and see, see what it has to say about I, it, right? I, I, you know, it's it's a concerning thing as a, as a big fan of the show Battlestar Galactica. When I was a kid, I, I worry about, you know, robots and computers just taking over and, and making us do the stuff they don't want to do instead of what we make them do. You know, they, so this might not even actually be us. There might just be chat. I, they could have, conversation they, right they now. could have gone back and, in and time, right? stepped on a real. butterfly, <laughs> and, and now it's robot Greg and James going at it. I, they're not as good as the authentic ones of us, but yeah, I, I don't know. I just think it seems like we put a lot of effort into allowing people to be lazier about certain things. And uh, look, sometimes I, I know people that use it to write descriptions, listen descriptions, and seems to work just fine for that. Well, ripping through, I mean, even to do lease abstracts, thinking about going through and reviewing hundreds of pages of leases. I mean, th th there are some some immediate- And if it could write market reports with all the sure. market reports I have to do, I'm, I'm all for it because it's 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 then, really- then you uh, just have to read the tea leaves. You don't, you don't have to pick them. Well, pretty soon I'll be out of the equation altogether. <laughs> just dump the data into, into some module and it'll tell me what the most important things are. And then what do we have to tell Greg for? We'll just host the show, yeah. And it'll be like a box I'll here or something. I'll still be here for you. I still want to hear what you have to say. I appreciate that. I probably would have lost my mind by then anyway, but or that's when I'll, I'll finally have to pursue my uh, musical career and, and give up on this because I don't think AI can do, AI that can do jazz sorry, yet. I, I don't think AI can do jazz yet. We'll see. I, I don't know. You talk about uncertainty. So we have a bunch of it right now. We, we have mm -hmm. uh, a couple of wars going on that, that are – you know, worried, you know, obviously worried about a lot of funding is being sent there. There's potential for problems in Taiwan. Um, with this presidential election, maybe, maybe you didn't notice <laughs> that it's hard not to. I, I don't buy that for the residential side, people won't buy a house because so-and-so might win. I think it's all a lot of talk and I don't think it happens. But there's a big difference between that and maybe investing hundreds of millions of right. dollars. Are you hearing any, you know, a lot of talk 
about any of these things in general. I'm sure it's on everybody's. You talked about certainty yeah. with legislation. Certainly, when wars are going on and uh, a presidential election, that that just adds to what we're kind of used to living with anyway. Yes, yeah, su surprisingly, I don't hear too much about the wars, about the the election. I hear a lot about interest rates. That that's what we hear about. And what I would say is, when there's global uncertainty, that tends to help New York because we become the safety deposit box. So we actually saw last year that foreign investment tripled. So we see foreign investment from all over the world coming here. I mean, we already talked about some of that coming in the form of luxury retail, right. but a lot of investors coming here and looking at New York as the safe haven. Um, but look, I, I think for most investors right now, uh, a lot of them are on the sidelines waiting for a rate cut to feel like, okay, finally it's time to jump back in. I frankly think that Blackstone's purchase of Air Communities was an incredible thing for the market, specifically New York, because you look at that portfolio, that was kind of what was previously known as AIMCO, and then they had a spinoff. But a lot of that multifamily was here in New York, LA, Gateway. And so the fact, you know, Blackstone says they're coming off the sidelines and they've got, I think, whether it's $60 billion plus of yeah, a little powder, bit of they're, money, they're, they're going to, they're going to deploy 10 billion. And I think there's a big herd mentality where I think a lot of investors are going to say, okay, this is time. Everybody wants to try to get into the market and buy at the bottom. We, we know that that's really tough uh, to do, but l l let's hope that a lot of the investors come off the sidelines. I, I will tell you, we just came out with our first quarter report and it was the most dollar volume that we've, that we've seen since, uh, since last year. So that was, a positive. When that you look at all the different asset classes, so multifamily, retail, office, land, it uh, culminated at about three billion dollars in sales across New York City. So we're still at twelve billion annualized. We're still less, or about a third of the thirty billion uh, average that happens here. So there, there's still a lot of pent up demand. There's still a lot of stuff that's going to have to get flushed through the system. The one point five trillion dollars worth of debt coming due. Uh, there's going to be a lot of opportunities over the next couple of years. Now, do you worry about, we always hearing that there's going to be this debt crisis when it comes due and, and rates are much higher now and, and yeah. all of that. It always seems to just get worked out. It, but, I don't know. But maybe don't we're, know not, we're, not, I, we're not watching I, as closely I, I, I as you. I wish I could be optim optimistic. I mean, I, I will tell you what's happening right now in the office space for sure. Because back in 2008, 2009, after the GFC, I was doing a lot of loan sales. A lot of these lenders with the office product are just saying, hey, let's just let this trade. Let's just, you know, I, I don't want the asset back. Let's not go through foreclosure. So that's happening. That That's going to get flushed through a lot quicker. I don't know what we do about multifamily here in New York, specifically the rent regulated stuff, because it's not, Greg, it's not just that the rates are going up. It's that the proceeds are coming down and you have so few lenders willing to be in that space. So Signature was the number two lender, right? For and multifamily then, New York. NYC, New York Community Bank's not going to do NYC anything NYCB now. bought, yeah, that yeah, stuff. So, yeah, so I mean, who, who, who does that, that leave? I mean, Chase has been you know, the number one multifamily lender, but they're not going out on a, a limb. They're not, they're not exactly giving, you know, 70, 80% leverage. I mean, th there's going to be a lot of these loans that come due and th there's equity in these deals, right? but, um, the proceeds are not going to be in there. So we're, we're going to have to see a lot of these cash in refis or owners are going to say, look, I either don't have the ability or the desire to pay this down. So I'm going to just sell it. Wow. So, what do you see for the rest of 24 outside of Rangers and Knicks championships? <laughs> right. What yeah. what else do you like see? That. Well, look, I, I think going back to the positives in the market, if you have vacant retail office, there's a lot of end users who are willing to step up and buy. I think we are going to see more residential conversions. It's going to take a little time to uh, have the city implement what the, the state has given us in the form of a tax abatement for wow. office to resi conversions to let office buildings up until 1990 be converted, not just the older ones. So that's gonna be positive. And um, I don't know, we're gonna have to see what this uh, good cause eviction does to the multifamily um, uh, demand. Uh, because in the meantime, you, you know, we're sitting with 1.4% vacancy. So, I mean, there is I know a lot they, of upper the housing, on rents. And I, I always tell people the housing and vacancy survey, when it does come out and it, it was delayed because of COVID, um, you know, that that's the, thing that triggers rent stabilization, right? That number gets above five, then rent stabilization goes bye-bye until they rewrite the- Right, the, yeah, I'm not, <laughs> just, not, not holding my breath on that. Yeah, no, uh, with full control in one party's hands, uh, they'll do it as much as they want. But it is a fascinating you know, report to look at because you can mm -hmm. see how, how old 
the the uh, units are and owner occupied. You know, people forget that even here in Manhattan, seventy percent of the people living here are renting. Right. You know that that's a remarkable thing. And when you you're looking at a one point four percent vacancy rate, well, break that number down about forty. Four, I think 45% of the rental units are rent stabilized. Very hard to get. A lot of those are warehouse. That leaves everybody else fighting for the rest of it, yeah, right? Look, or, or, or Jersey or Westchester. I mean, mm. there, you're going to see a lot more development for people who want to work here, be here, but might not be able to afford to I'm be seeing, here. I'm a Long Island guy, and, and I see a lot more luxury rentals going up these mm -hmm. days uh, in the nicer areas and parts I'm, I'm not allowed to go to, but it's... Yeah, people have to live somewhere. And now there, there is more of a push to get people back to the office. It's not working so much as planned, but it's funny too that some of the biggest companies calling for it are tech firms. Mm. Because they, I guess they own a lot of space, so they want, they want to fill it. Um, now, before we go, you have a podcast. Mm -hmm. Why don't you tell the folks about it? Because I was listening to one you did um, recently about somebody who, got into planning somebody from Detroit who yes. who worked in city yeah. you know worked at EDC and get to planning so pa pa Paula Carruthers who runs uh, real estate for, for the, the archdiocese yeah. yeah so the, the name of the show is the same name of the book the insider's edge to real estate investing I told you he wrote the book yeah, so, so call it a, uh, a a passion project but no it's 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 been a, a great thing and uh, all of my stuff you can find on jamesnelson.com. I mean, again, it's, the site's not about, uh, how great I am. It's, it's really about, that's where it kind of reads, it kind of reads that way, Maybe but well, <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you, yeah, I mean, we're, we're bragging, slapping ourselves on the back for 22 episodes, right? Like. That, yeah. That's, you yeah. know, that's nothing. No, it's you a lot of work. And, and I think it's it's incredible the insight that you all are, are giving out there. And I, I think... Um, well, you got any tips for us us young? Well, I, I talked about, I mean, I know that this is recorded and you'll air it later. And so if you drop an F-bomb, they can uh, they can cut it out. But I, I go live. So... I, I want to go. You know? I want to go live. But there, there are certain I, reasons why... I understand. They, I understand. You know, because to me, I you have to watch it back, yeah. right, to approve it and... There's nothing more painful than staring at myself and listening I, to myself I, for 36 I minutes. I can't watch the previous episodes. But yeah, we, do, we just put it out there. So it's on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter. So it, it's been a great thing. I love the feedback. Uh, and I, I, hopefully it inspires people to go out and do great things. I mean, again, I will say this next year or two, I've been doing this for 25 years. I truly believe the next year or two, we're going to see some of the best buying opportunities for investments that we've seen uh, in decades. And so this book tells you how to do it. The, the number one, when I go and guest lecture and I ask students, you know, why haven't you jumped in and started investing? You know, the, the two reasons they give, the, the, the top one is lack of capital and lack of, of knowledge, right? So the knowledge, by listening to this, you can learn. The lack of capital, look, you find a great opportunity. That's the value you bring to the table. You have a great opportunity. You can go find a partner who right. has the capital, right? So that, the book, I didn't want the book just to be about theory. I want someone to be able to read the book and say, okay, I understand how this works, whether you've been doing this, you know, for decades or not. So I, I hope people get a lot of benefit out of it. Well, that's, see, that's very inspirational. So we're just going to end on that because I can't beat that. Thank you, James Nelson, <laughs> so you. much. And thanks to Ray and Lena for all the work they do behind the scenes. And most of all, thanks to the audience. Wouldn't have the show without you. And your support has been tremendous so far. So thank you very much. And I look forward to crossing the line with you again next week.